everyone. Welcome to series five of the GBA Lightbulb Sessions. The Great British Entrepreneur Awards in association with BT Skills for Tomorrow have designed a free live stream series of Lightbulb Sessions to support small businesses and entrepreneurs with insightful and advice-driven sessions, featuring some of the UK's brilliant entrepreneurial minds to illuminate your path to entrepreneurial success. You can find out more about BT Skills for Tomorrow by heading to their website at www pt.com forward slash skills for tomorrow or by clicking on the link in the comment section. In this session we'll sit down with Will King, founder of Sustainable Businesses, Above and Beyond and King of Shaves and Earth Care team lead of Lesh, Tally Davis. Will and Tally will share their top tips and advice on how to make sure that the packaging of your products are sustainable to phase out the plastic. They will go through design and function, how this can impact the planet and the importance of zero waste packaging for businesses. There is an opportunity to ask questions during the session. If you have a question you'd like to ask, you can pop this in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer these towards the end of the session. Please note there will be a poll at the end of the session, and all answers will be anonymous. And with that, I'll pass over to our host today, Francesca James. Thank you so much, Chloe and uh, Will, Tally, thank you for joining us. Uh, I do hope you can hear me. As you know, we were having a few network issues um, just before this. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for joining us. A uh, huge fan of both of the, the brands um, that, that you're involved in and we're here to, here to talk about today. Um, I know we've got audience, uh, some on Zoom and lots of people joining us on our YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn and uh, Twitter. Um, so let's start. Um, I'm going to ask for a, an introduction and if you can tell us about yourselves and what you do. And Will, can I come to you first? Yeah. Hi, Fran. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tally. Delighted to be on the Zoom with you. A huge fan of Lush for many years. Um, so I founded a shaving brand, King of Shaves, many years ago, age 27. This was my very first packaging that somehow I managed to convince Fiona Kemp, the boot spire, to take and launched it in 1993, originally in Harrods, and then into Boots. And since then, I think we've done around 16 billion shaves. We're listed, you know, major retailers nationally and internationally, and of course, are constantly striving to improve, you know, the performance of the product, but also take note of the impact of the packaging, which I'll be coming on to talk about later. So delighted to be here. Um, thank you very much, Frank. Thank you so much. And, and Tally, uh, again, huge fan of Lush, doesn't need uh, much of an introduction. But I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and, and what your role at Lush uh, entails. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, my name's Tally. I currently work in our earth care part of the business. I've been with the company for about 18 and a half years. Um, I started as what I consider myself as a bit of a school dropout. Um, so no, no qualifications at all, but um, working in a business where we do a lot of promoting within. Um, so it's been great to be part of this journey with Lush um, and being fully exposed as to what we've done prior to Lush being around before 1995, uh, understanding where the business grew from its previous business, which was Cosmetics to Go, um, and then businesses before that, which was Constantine and Weir. So we still very much have the founders very present in our company. Um, and yeah, it's been good to kind of see how innovative we've been, maybe a bit too ahead of time uh, at some points, but luckily we've managed to kind of uphold our key ethics when it comes to naked products. Um, and I think people are starting to get the concept and we see that a lot more prominent now on the high streets and um, other, other beauty brands. Thank you so much. Um, Will, you held up some packaging in your intro um, and uh, obviously mentioned that you, you launched King of Shaves nearly 30 years ago. How, uh, and, and Tally then mentioned obviously being ahead of, ahead of the time and the changing over the last uh, sort of 20, 30 years. How has your, how has business's perception of packaging changed in that time frame for you, Will? So um, when, when we launched, we were a startup and kind of had no money. And when you have no money, you have to do things what I call in a very lean way. And that includes, of course, you know, what you can afford to spend on, on the packaging. So when I held this up here, this is a very thin piece of card and clearly card is, um, can be recycled, no issue there. It however has a very small bottle of plastic in it and a lot of plastic cannot be recycled or it isn't recycled. Um, there's an issue there which we'll come on to. But the amount of volume of packaging, holding 10 mil of shaving oil, that will give you 60 shaves. There was almost, without me knowing it, a, 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 an approach to having the least amount of packaging for the most amount of function at, at the time. And I didn't know that. 
and that was driven out of a desire to reduce costs. So when you're looking at, at doing things, it's kind of important you spend the least you can on the things that people throw away or you hope will be recycled and the most you can on the actual pop packaging. So over the years, um, putting this one down, this is what for many years we looked like, which is again a cart, it's holding a bottle. Again, the bottle, the bottle is plastic. Um, so this would have been launched probably around about 12, 15 years ago. 75 shades, we've increased the size of the mill fill. It has a custom bottle inside it, packaging on the back, and then it has a call to act, a variety of call to actions, for example, win an iPad. So we're trying to give people a reason to buy the products as well. Three or four years ago, um, we, we started looking at the impact of plastic on single use packaging. So we, we mustn't denigrate plastic. It has uses and very correct uses in the world, <coughs> but not the things that you're gonna buy, use and then bin, yeah? So two years ago, we started a project called Code Zero. That was to transition King of Shades out of single use plastic into lifetime use refillable bottles. So we then transition into a lifetime use refillable aluminium bottle. Beautiful, it's got a QR code on the back of it so you can find out more about it and then partnered it with our shaving gel. And those came into the market in um, spring 2020 and then they have refills and the refills are made from a PE laminate. So it's single um, laminate. So it can go into the same plastic waste stream as for example, shopping bags. Um, you have to use scissors to cut it because if you mix the plastic, so you then can't recycle it. But we managed to take our use of plastic in this and in this down by 72 to 84%. So we like the thing, we're doing our best to be respectful and responsible as a brand to the planet and to our customers. But of course, when you're a fan of a business, you can kind of do what you want to do, yeah? So we wanted to lead the narrative. We wanted to walk the talk. I see a, a ton of rubbish out there about sustainability and greenwashing and PCR, post-consumer recycled plastic, which is a bit of a cop-out, um, cop-out 26, so to speak. And, um, and, and we've led in that way. And of course, when he, when he comes to talk to Tally with, with their approach, they've been extraordinarily um, zealous about reducing the amount of packaging that they've used. Hence the success of the brand, you know, nearly 30 years later like us. So that's been our journey with regard to responsibility in packaging, but also delight. It's lovely and it, it lasts a lifetime and it's substantial and it, it, it's still a delight to have on your um, bathroom sink when you're shaving. Thanks so much, Will. Tally, you mentioned you've been with Lush for 18 and a half years. What's, what's your take on the changes that you've seen um, over those 18 years? I think for me, there's been um, a lot of things that have been consistent. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Lush have kind of been a bit too innovative at times, ahead of the times with solid naked products. And it's really now that people are kind of getting that concept. So seeing those sales um, driven by being naked products that you know are effective see those increase have been great but also changing our mentality towards packaging so for us packaging matters um, packaging can be great packaging can be such a great way to kind of expose and present the brand and i think what we've done in lush here is that we have made sure that we want to stick to the branding that we want. We want the products to be shown in their real state. We want the naked ranges, but we appreciate that consumers still sometimes find those naked ranges a little bit too out there and want their typical bottle or pro, uh, product in a pot to put in their bathroom. So it does have to look good. It has to be functional. And certainly for us as a company where we use as little preservatives as possible, it also has to ensure that the product can last for periods of time. One of the benefits that we have in Lush that we launched in 2011 is the Bring It Back scheme. So as much as we wanted to give the onus on the customers to make sure that they recycle the plastic correctly, we're more than aware that as a brand decision, we have made that commitment to maintain having black branded pots. We know though that that does have an issue within the recycling industry and how that cannot be detected. So what we've decided to do is maintain that, but close loop that waste stream. So we invite the customers to bring those pots back and in return, historically up until now, they've been given a free face mask to reward them for the efforts. 
but where we want our customers to bring all of our packaging back, the reward for that is 50p off per packaging bought back on your shopping within Lush. We're given a commitment to the customer to say, please bring your packaging back and we will do good with it. And with that, then that follows into what we have is our green hub here in Paul in Dorset. And our green hub is the facilitation where we take all of the ownership of our waste management from the customers sending back their pots and bottles, but also our manufacturing processes as well. So what we do here is we process all of the plastic, whether that's PET, HDPE, LDPE and black pots, which is PP. We wash, we granulate, and then we send back to our supplier to make that back into black pots. So it's 100% recycled, a really lovely closed loop. And what we hope to do in the future with our revamped uh, relocation of the Green Hub is to really invite the public and the customers to come along with the Green Hub, see that waste can be great, and to see the whole cycle in, in all of its glory of the pot coming back from the customer, that being granulated, and then seeing the process of that being made into another black pot. Thank you so much, Tally. It's it's fascinating the the journey that both of you have been on. Tally, part of your role um, ensures that Lush adheres to environmental legislation. Could you um, could you give the audience a bit of a an overview in um, in terms of what packaging needs to do from a legislative legislative point of view? Yes, so in terms of my role, um, it's very much manufacturing focus. So it's making sure that all of the operations that we do is carried out in the right way and that we don't pose any risk on our local environment. But on a wider scale, there's a bigger team that works on from a brand perspective. So we have individuals in our team who have worked out our climate strategy to come to net zero for the next 20 years. Um, we've got people that live and breathe protesting and uh, activism to really shout about that message across uh, to the business. In terms of the packaging, uh, there, there are various things that we're looking at and I know that Loop is quite prominent nowadays in terms of like the refill. Um, we're looking at how we can use less energy within processing plastic that comes back to us. So, you know, is it right that we, if we use our shredding services that obviously use a lot of energy but is there a way we can be really good water stewards and use water to wash as opposed to energy having to then use all of that to recycle again into a new pot so for us our key principles are the the product and the pot have to be functional it has to look good um, but there's also the kind of flexibility to really look at other, other ways that we can use packaging. So one of the great uh, innovations that we've had is our cork pot, which you can find on the website. This is predominantly used um, and bought separately to store shampoo bars in. Um, so this is produced in southern Portugal. Um, it's packaging that fights climate change. Um, it's 100% natural. It's climate positive. It's uh, carbon positive. And also the, the group that we work with on that, they also support rewilding um, within the area as well. So that's more than just being sustainable, that's being regenerative. Um, and that kind of links into our, our phrase of, that we, we talk a lot about in Lush is leaving the world lusher than we found it. So using those resources, but making sure that we give back to leave the you know, the natural environment's better than we found them. So we very much pride ourselves on that regeneration. Thank you so much, Tally. Um, we've called this session, um, Getting Your Packaging Right. Um, Will, I'd love to, to hear from you, you know, even at a time when a lot of brands are trying to do a lot more to be sustainable, um, how are they getting it wrong? So, I think, I mean, if people saw my Twitter feed a couple of days back, we received um, an Amazon parcel some batteries, and it was massively, let's call it overpacking. So, albeit in cardboard, which is all good, um, a lot of air in it. And then, of course, um, you know, that goes back to hopefully be recycled. But I think when, when you look at brands and what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it, it it's, there is a temptation, especially, for example, in luxury goods, where you have a huge amount of packaging, which ends up with a tiny little piece of jewellery. And there's, a, there's an assumption that more is somehow going to give you more delight and, 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 and joy in that. And of course, it, 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 it's less, um, in my opinion. 
So I have a number of sort of things that are at the top of mind when it comes to packaging. So, of course, you have things like reduce to the max, okay? Um, you know, that we use the very minimum you need to use. You then look at, for example, thinness, um, by which I mean a minimal amount of material to achieve the, um, the benefits required of it. The thinnest material in the world um, is also the most expensive material in the world, and that's called graphene which is a, uh, basically a super strong um, piece of material technology developed out of the University of Manchester. But it's so thin, but it, the thinness of it can like support 200 elephants in about, you know, um, say a meter or a 10 by 10 meter side. So when we look at um, product and packaging, we try to reduce to the max. We then try to have the least possible impact we can genuinely give it an, an opportunity to be recycled and not for gazy recycled. Um, you, you mentioned, Fran, you know, in, in the tweets, 91% of plastic will be produced today will not be recycled, all right? It will either be landfilled or it will be incinerated. And even if it's something like, for example, TerraCycle are doing, where they're attempting to take out of the landfill space something that can be made into something else, Plastic is, is composed of what they call long, long chain polymers, um, which are great when you have virgin plastic. When you go to second use, the polymers start to break down and then you, you end up with something that is basically a plastic mass and you can't do anything with it. So when you look at the packaging, I would say, for example, you look at an iPhone, okay? It's very thin, yeah, very thin. It's not big and thick and fat. Um, you then look at the packaging that said iPhone comes in. There's not a lot of air, and this is a very old one. This is an iPhone 4. Um, but it's, it's using cardboard, it's, it's displaying the product, it has some, um, you know, lovely gold sort, um, sort of silver foil on it. But when you open it, as you see, it drops down. Now that's patented. You cannot copy the ability for your packaging in the iPhone world to do that. So there's a delight to that. Yeah, that, that's an unboxing delight. That's beautiful. When I think you referenced um, King of Shades, I've done like these sunglasses. My wife, Tiger, who's creative director, here's how they turn up, boring shipper box. You take it out, you have the packaging here, but you then have an ability where it just slides out. So we've kind of taken what iPhone are doing in the luxury brand, taken it into sunglasses, put it into a similar format, not in a boring box. It's got two parts to it. They're both recyclable. The ink printed on it is um, is natural. It's not got um, you know, it's not got metals in it. And again, it has a certain delight to it. And the unboxing, just finally on the above and beyond, the last time you used refillable lip balms. Again, you have this comes to your letterbox. It says the name on everyone's lips will soon be on yours. It's a lip balm. You undo it. It's got a nice presentation of, of the planet, and you're smiling. It's got the container. It's got the, light, the um, compostable refills that are made from wood and plant substrate. They compost in nine months. No plastic, zero plastic. The very minimum amount of packaging that we can do, both for this one and the refill pack, which will be going out soon. Again, a similar thing, QR codes. It's about really looking at the impact this has versus the necessary um, use of the actual lip balm itself. And then the material in this, aluminium, wonderful material. Aluminium, when melted, goes back to, smelted, well, goes back to aluminium, as does gold. Other ones don't, Stay, steel doesn't, it's a composite. Um, iron doesn't, other materials. So it's a simplicity and a materials usage, as, as Tali was explaining, um, for the product, that's important. But the packaging, it's got to have as little or zero or positive impact on the planet, again, as Tally said, with regards to her cork, um, which are net carbon positive. So that's kind of a little summary of how we go about doing things. Yeah. What about you, Tally? Have you seen any uh, examples uh, that you'd like to sort of call upon of, of, of when um, people are getting it wrong? Obviously, with the session today is about getting it right. So pitfalls are, are always useful as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I think as we've all come out of this, well, still in the global pandemic and how online sales have been, I think that's definitely been an eye opener in terms of what we receive from different brands and, and how they don't utilise their packaging enough or cater to the items that they're selling. 
I think we need to change the narrative a little bit. I think there's been a lot of talk on that plastic and pollution and waste, but plastic and packaging can be great if it's designed correctly. Um, what we need to kind of factor in is that the cost of packaging is factored into the, the price of the product that you're buying. And we really need to make sure that with um, Will's example there of the, the products that you have is looking at those packaging items as an asset for the customer and using that method of being able to refill or send back to be refilled or send back to be recycled. I think it's having those solutions in place. I think what I find is that there are a lot of brands now that are kind of jumping on the terror cycle side of things. I think what does concern me is that it's very much um, open to all. So as Will, you were saying about mixed plastics, there's a lack of transparency of really knowing what's going on with that plastic as well. Although that there's a solution for everything, the method is not as transparent as potentially we would like as a brand. We kind of focus on transparency and being able to be honest to our customers. I think as well for us here in Paul in Dorset, we know that recycling rates within our council are poor. We know that their recycling rate here in Dorset is 12%. However, being committed to trying to make a change and investing in our recycling hub that we have, we have full control on what we do with anything that is designed to be sent for out of life, so end of life, sorry. And we know that our recycling rate as a business is 85%. So on a much smaller scale, we know that we are doing great things. And what we're hoping for is with our relocation and kind of changing our, our uh, processes slightly and widening our closed loops that we can invite the public. We can invite people from the waste industry. We can invite people from the cosmetic industry and be part of what we call a cosmetic and waste revolution to really understand how we manage the waste streams and to hopefully that be a call of action to young people or people within those industries to really pressure their beauty brands that they potentially might buy from or their local council. So yeah, I think there's at the moment there seems to be a lot of jumping on the uh, terror cycle bandwagon, but a severe lack of transparency in knowing what their processes are. Thank you so much, Ruth. Can we can we move on and talk about um, design and functionality and how that um, marries up and, and works with sustainability? Um, you know. It, is it achievable without taking on soaring costs that might risk putting a small business at a brand? And I'm, uh, I'm doing that here. You know, I've got my uh, um, above and beyond uh, lip balm from Will, and I think that actually, you know, this is this is one of the most beautifully designed products I've had in my pocket um, uh, in a long, long time. So I'd love to get both of your thoughts on 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 that. Um, did you want to go first, Tally, or should I go? So, so, so when it comes to design, I'm a bit of a, and I'm, a bit, I'm a bit of an outlier. Um, I should have studied ship science and yacht design at Southampton, but I flunked A levels and, and ended up doing mechanical engineering at Portsmouth Poly or University of Portsmouth. So I, I'm kind of an engineer, okay. But then I have a weird creative trait, curiosity as as to why things are the way they are. And then almost immediately start looking at them and think, like, thinking, could they be better? Um, so, so that hybrid of, of looking at things, even when it, whether it comes to a shaving product, you know, we could have launched a can of shave gel like Gillette Cell, but no, we, we launched like a little tiny bottle of shaving oil. And um, we did the shaving oil because it lubricates and you don't get the razor burn. But of course, it, it's a boring shaving oil. It's got a boring product. You then got to, to wrap it in a delight or look at what you're going to do. And, and, and when you reference A and B, um, Fran above and beyond, it's like, okay, so here we are, here is a Nivea um, plastic lip balm, 650 million of those end up in um, um, landfill in the safe incineration, very small, very similar to the King of Shaves packaging. If you look at it, not, not massively dissimilar at all. But what we needed to do was to kind of give a delight to the usage. So when we look to the design of this, it's a lip balm. How boring can it be? Of course, you can buy a Vaseline in the tub and you can do that. Petroleum jelly, not perhaps so good. Um, 
so we when we look to the design aesthetics of this we call this a nopple yeah so it's a no plastics thing that looks like a nipple a bit naughty there but if you put it in your pocket like fran said earlier you don't lose it and it's easily found at the bottom of your handbag the screwing it also kind of looks a bit like a stress ball so what we find is people they sit there and they screw unscrew and they fiddle with it especially if they're like at times of trying to think about things and then when you come to look at it because it's delightful and it's aluminium and it's lifetime and it's cute and it's nice and then there's a nice black one um, and then next year we're going to have a, a less, less expensive one made out of the same substrate as the refills. It's got an ability to use the minimum amount of packaging to deliver the maximum amount of impact with a product that you'll hopefully have in your life your whole life. The key thing with packaging and how you use it, it, it has a function to protect the product through to point of purchase or transit by the customer. After that, it's kind of largely not needed. So the cue is to try and, and what Lush doing with the refillable pots or the cork jars or there, trying to give it a longevity that so it doesn't hit the planet's landfill tips or, or mess around with the planet. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of lucky. I have this weird engineering, product design, trade, creative curiosity. I'm married to um, a lady called Tiger, hence the painting in the back, Tiger Savage. She's a, an art director, creative director. So when we look at things, they, they almost go to a, a singularity of purpose from the get-go. And if you can do that with your brand or product, don't just do what everybody else is doing. She might get what they, they're getting, which may not be so good. Try and look at things through a slightly different lens, a different narrative. Again, exactly as Tally was saying, Lush being a bit ahead of the curve, black packaging can't be recycled very challenging let's shift that etc 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 and then take in as much knowledge as you can thank you so much tally did you have anything to add there yeah i've, I've just noticed some of the questions um in the chat so uh in terms of what we want the packaging to do in terms of design is for us can be quite challenging because we are a company where we don't use a lot of preservatives and our products as we say on our shop windows is fresh so they do have a, you know a, a life end of life we don't want uh, customers using products that could last potentially years on end so it can be quite challenging to make sure that the packaging works for the product so within our fresh face mask there's no preservatives um, within those and they only have a shelf life of 21 days. So we need to make sure that like from an engineering perspective that that product is designed airtight and the plastic doesn't then react with the product to then cause issues, which we have experienced over the years. Going back to refill, I think is a really interesting uh, thing to discuss because I guess when you look back to maybe 1940s, 30s, the 20s, there's a generation of people that were used to reusing, whether that's their shopping bags, you know, you see tomato ketchup, they've always used glass, um, and now they are also part of the loop uh, system where you can refill your ketchup bottle. So the refilling is definitely a, a preferred option, it's less energy intensive, it's obviously then giving that narrative to the customer that their packaging matters and that it's an asset to them and that they can go and get out to the high streets and refill as and they need to. For us, it's definitely been a challenge with refill. It's something that we've tried in years gone by, um, but we feel that we're at, at a place now where we can refill and we are looking into that in terms of how we do that in store, whilst also trying to ensure that we give the customer great experience on the shop floor as well there's so much out there there's so much that uh, kind of it, it does make you wonder how does a customer kind of navigate their way around to buying the right product as will has mentioned there's a lot of greenwashing um you know there's a lot of words that are being used that kind of make people feel that they're doing the right thing but you know it's not always the case so so yeah, I think a lot of it is down to communication. And I think if you are a, a, a independent 
retail brand like we are within Lush, that we have that ability to be able to engage with our, our customers. In terms of kind of making packaging look amazing and how that can be challenging, in years gone by, we had a sister company called Be Never Too Busy To Be Beautiful, which was our kind of sideline to makeup. Um, and the makeup was stunning. We had very few shops, um, but they were kind of at places like in central London, Covent Garden. And again, it was something ahead of its time where is, it was in this beautiful packaging. It was all very kind of like Hollywood glam looking in these like Indian um, handcrafted pots. But 15 years ago, it just wasn't something that people felt that they could spend the money on. Now we see how beauty is growing and how different brands are really trying to make their packaging eye catch. And I felt I feel now that if we were to relaunch it, it probably would do really well. But I think we're still a little bit scarred from you know it kind of going going under. So yeah, it is important to get the packaging right. I think it should be seen as an as an asset um, and should certainly be seen as something where you know, the customers can take ownership of that and understand that they've spent money on that packaging to look, you know, and so to look after that and um, offer the service of refilling, um, whether that's in-store or via online or postal or whatever that may be. Thanks, Tally. Well, we lost you for, for a short while there. We were just touching on Carl's question that came in as well, who said, I'd like a little bit more elaboration on the refilling mechanism of products, please. Uh, yeah, so... So I just took myself off to go and find some examples, perhaps, of that. So I thought that's all, what you've done. Um, when you come to refilling, clearly your product has to be designed to be refilled. OK, so you need to look at that from the very get go. And, and when you look at the above and beyond um, the mantra called unscrew the planet. My wife, Tiger, wants to call it unfuck the future. But we thought that might be a little bit of edgy in terms of getting boots to the stick. Um, but let's go unscrew the planet. If something can be screwed or unscrewed, it can be reused, okay? It's likely it can be reused. If it's a push-on product where it snap fits, which is much less expensive to make because of the engineering and manufacturing of them, um, they're, they're almost likely single-use by use bin, yeah? So unscrew the planet. Then you have a mantra when it comes to refilling. I'm a big fan. I'm not a big fan of sustainable. I'm a big fan of responsible. So I've coined the phrase FMRECG, fast moving, recyclable, refillable, reusable, reimagined, um, reinvented, um, consumer goods. And then you've got to apply that mantra to product packaging. So for example, if you're in the business of selling shave um, products, you can do a shave bar, um, the soap, here it is, here is your wooden holder, you refill it, um, you use it, okay? The issue with that is not so many men use that type of shaving substrate. However, when you come to deodorants, for example, which will be one of Above Beyond's um, future product launches, let's look at Dio's. So for years, here is a well-known brand. Um, it's a push-up Dio. This is entirely plastic, and it will almost certainly entirely go into landfill or be incinerated. That's bollocks and ridiculous. Can't be having any of that. What will we launch? We'll do a beautiful aluminium, um, lifetime use refillable, where you unscrew it, here's the refill. This is a 3B rapid prototypes, a piece which is in tooling at the moment. That will be made out of the same substrate as this that I'll come on to. You pop it in, you screw it in, you use it in your pits, then it's got a QR code on the back to reorder it. So no, first time anybody's seen any of that, so don't screenshot it. Um, and then when you come to the, the design of the, of the refillables, Again, this is plant, wood, binder, substrate, um, it, it composts. You could actually use this lip balm just like that without the container, yeah? We've chosen to keep it brown because it's natural, all right? We can color it with natural colorants. You could sell that as a product and it will be less expensive, but it it's, doesn't have a screw thread on it because it's very difficult to do the screw thread tolerances of that. Um, so we put it, we choose to put it into the, um, you know, the refillable container, you pop it off, you pop it in, you screw it up, take it off, protection, use. But there's a lot of thought and engineering and reduce, 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 reduce 
um, to be a responsible brand and manufacturer. Whereas the easy option is make it in plastic, make it cheap shit, dip shit out of China, ship shit, ship loads of it. Not good. And, and the companies that will continue to do that will be the kind of companies that will fail in the future because they won't have embraced of doing things differently to get a different, a different outcome. So designed to be refilled, reused and reduced. That's the mantra you must start with, not just make it cheap and sell it as much as you can. Fantastic, Nathan. I hope that that answers your question. Um, Perky Blender is possibly the best uh, coffee name I have ever come across. Uh, and, and fantastic team too, a great British entrepreneur, uh, alumni member. Um, Will, I wanted to, to um, come to you and, and uh, the question I've got is that sustainability as a journey has been used quite a lot in recent years. I know that you said that you know you, you prefer to talk about responsibility rather than sustainability. But do you think that um, we'll reach a point where sustainability, responsibility can no longer be a journey for brands and that they need to be achieving it from X point? Yeah, look, I mean, I make this if people follow me on LinkedIn or they see the post on my Twitter or the commentary that I give. There is no saying in the world which says with great power comes great sustainability. It's a bollocks word. Yeah. It's like there's nothing in life that's sustainable. We're born, we live, we die, and life is not sustainable. Yeah, the sun burning away in 93 million years, it might implode itself, and that isn't sustainable. However, it's kind of a nice sort of friendly, yeah, I'm sustainable, me, very good, congratulations. Um, responsibility is a much harder word. With great power comes great responsibility. Um, it's a much harder word. It's, it's a word that people kind of think, oh, hang on a minute, am I being responsible in my behavior? Anybody can be sustainable, yeah? Anybody can do that. But it's, it's a fiction word. So when, you, when I talk about this and coining FMRECG um, or the importance of responsibility or look at what you're doing and why you're doing it and what you expect the output to be, as, as a brand founder with my name in my product with King of Shades, but I'm able to narrate and talk about things without fear of being sacked by my board of directors. I, I, can, I can articulate what I want to do and why, and nobody can tell me not to. And as long as I believe responsibly um, in my heart of hearts, it's I'm saying the right thing. I'll just wait for the world to catch up with that. Yeah. But I want to be helping them get there. And that's why I think it's super, you know, important and relevant what Lush are doing, where, where they've gone about this almost from the get go with as minimal packaging as natural as you can, as few preservatives, let's not fuck with the planet, let's not screw it up. They're one of the brands that, you know, haven't screwed the planet. Tons of others have, yeah. And, and they're going, oh my God, Will King, he's taking King of Shades, what does it mean? And, and they're all following, I can see, because obviously I see you've used my LinkedIn and all this stuff. And, and gradually, we want to be the guys that are leading a change to responsibility and, and just sack off this whole sustainability greenwashy space. But that's just my little you know, tirade on that. Be more responsible and um, sustainability will come along with you for the journey. That's a great answer. Tally, have you got anything to add to that? No, I, I mean, I think that was uh, perfectly said. I, I agree. I think sustainable, being sustainable isn't enough. We need to, we're at a point where we need to be regenerative um, and we need to put back what, all the wrongs that we've done over the years. And, and certainly for us, you know, our, our key master plan and being part of this cosmetic revolution, one of our key performance indicators is to detox the planet um, and, and put back what, it sh what should be there. So, you know, we're at a point now, we've got COP26 going on and, and companies should be really looking at their carbon, you know, being carbon positive or carbon neutral. And, and even that, you know, you need to have a strategy for that and how you can reduce your emissions. But, you know, even when you say, carbon um, offset you know that's basically another way of saying well I'm going to do it anyway I'm going to produce the carbon but I'll plant a few more trees which we won't feel the benefit from until like 20 years time so we need to be doing something and I think for us the court pot is a lovely example of that and that it can be done um, as well so yeah regeneration uh, is certainly what we kind of try to follow and the luxury of of Lush is the fact that we 
take ownership on everything we do from the sourcing of ingredients. We go visit um, the communities and make sure that everything is, is in order. They're being paid fairly, they have access to medical. Um, there's no middleman kind of uh, making money out of, a, of a, you know, a natural source and it's being done properly. Uh, look, I think we could be here um, all, all day talking about this, and I'm really, uh, I really wish we were. We've had a question come in from Alden, who's, who's popped a few bits in, in the chat. What approach can we take to challenge the government over its definitions for the plastic tax? Um, so he's expanded, I believe, the current plans, plant, uh, plant-based compostable packaging will be taxed in the same way as virgin uh, plastics made from fossil fuels. What are companies like King of Shaves and Lush doing to lobby this type of policy making and lead the sustainability agenda? Who'd like to take that big question? <laughs> oh, so, so, so on the plastic tax, that's coming down the track where companies are going to be taxed according to their volume usage of what's called virgin plastic and um, PCR gets slightly different treatment. But for some ridiculous bollocks reason, people have taken plastics um, as to be not just fossil fuel origin originated plastics, i.e. byproduct of oil, um, which Sean Sutherland, the plastic client, would say is the oil industry's big guilty secret. So they want to, as people use less oil in making petrol, they want to make more profits from making plastics. So that's not very good. But for some ri ridiculous reason, they've lumped in what are called bioplastics or plastics that plastic is a hybrid material but it comes from um you know not from fossils so the refill for a and b comes from basically wood waste wood side streams from wood that's grown for print and packaging and we take the shitty stuff clever company mixes it up makes it into beautiful um refillables for our um for our a and b range we and i um I'm, I'm part of the british beauty council with millie kendall they have a sustainable beauty coalition note sustainable i i'd love them to change it change it to be responsible beautiful coalition maybe they will but maybe they won't but as part of that i'm therefore able to be part of what the um british beauty council are doing in terms of lobbying the treatment of let's call it plastics taxation to say not all plastics are the same plastics yeah some plastics are good, some plastics aren't so good. So you need to have that as definitions. But because the government are, are rightly going to tax manufacturers and or resellers of plastic, that because that's going to hit them in the wallet where it hurts and their businesses, there will be a change. But clearly, it's no accident that we've moved push out plastic, moved to metal. It's no accident that we've gone aluminium use with a, with a um, wood plant-based refill. They are not plastic. Yeah, but it is a legislation. Often government ministers and industry bodies, they, they have a view. Clearly, there's a huge lobbying outfit out there um, trying to say, yay, plastics are recyclable. Don't sack off the plastic. Plastic is fantastic. But that's, that's lobbying. That's politics. That's agenda. And, and I'm just a voice, hopefully, walking the talk to just need a more responsible approach. And taxation and legislation is important. And you'll see that in France and many other European countries. Tally, if you've got anything to add there, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but I think this is just a really important one to answer. Yeah, I think, um, as you've mentioned, Will, with the Beauty Council, one of our financial people that's part of the Earth Care team has also started to kind of put their foot into that. And I hope that that is kind of a collaboration where multiple groups can get together and really set that standard because there is no set criteria on what should warrant the tax and what doesn't. Um, so yeah, so I think Lush actively will always have their fingers in a lot of pies and will be ready to kind of act and, and pounce on that when, when it's the right time to make sure that, that that's lobbied and that's kind of changed. Um, I think the only other thing to add really is that we, we are in a, at a point now with packaging where, you know, sustainable, biodegradable, that these are all lovely terms that are being used, um, but also abused at the same time. So, you know, biodegradability, there should be a standard of what warrants that. We shouldn't have that for, you know, 20 years. It should be able to, you know, compost within 30 days, 90 days, 120 days, nothing more than a year. So there's a lot of terminology there. And I think getting the, the structure in place on what other companies have to be accountable for, but having uh, a structure in place where there is accountability, where you cannot just be greenwashing customers. Um, it, it's not right. 
in, especially when there's so many brands out there, it's hard for customers to really navigate where to go. It absolutely is. And as I mentioned, we, we certainly could be here all day. There's some brilliant feedback coming through um, on, on, the, uh, on the chat. Um, before we leave today, if I could push you both for what you, you would consider to be your, your key takeaways um, from this session, the bits that, that people really ought to have front of mind as, as they leave. Uh, Will, can I come to you? Yeah, sure. So, so first of all, um, all the all the reads, yeah, all the reads. The responsibility, reuse, reinvent, reimagine. But the the, the 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 mission critical one is basically three words, which is reduce. The less shit in the world, the less shit there is to shovel. Yeah, reuse. So keep reusing the same product, your refillable water bottle made out of aluminium or or, or a, a thing, and refill where you can because. It, it, the mentality we've sunk into in the past 30 years, since I've been, I was born in 65 alive. It's only come along in my lifetime, the buy years then, yeah, before it was like refill your water bottles, milk bottles, sort of meat from the butcher in paper. It's a convenience, and obviously consumers will, will go there. So reduce, reuse, refill. However, with packaging, it is a thing that, that sells your product to the customer. So it's got to have design, function, and delight. Okay? Um, design, function, and delight. And then finally, just um, be aware that whatever um, you know you're consuming, it 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 doesn't want to hang around after it's being consumed. So so just respect the planet um, and and think about the impact that you're having with your products and just go and screw the planet. So those three sort of things would be my key. You know, sort of if you if you don't listen to anything else, all the reads, bit of delight, and don't fuck the planet. Thank you, and Tally. Yeah, uh, I think just use your money wisely. Uh, there's a lot of companies where, whether they're small independent businesses or, or huge that are really doing some great work and, you know, buying carefully can really help to contribute that. Um, ultimately, as a consumer, you're paying for that product, you're paying for that packaging. It's factored in the, the cost price of that product. So, you know, what you purchase and consume, make sure that that packaging can be reused and beneficial to you. Um, so that factors into the refill, you know, reuse. Um, and just make it work for you long term. Uh, you know, there is a lot of businesses out there and I think that there is a lot of greenwashing and I, um, the uh, ethical consumer is a really good guide to use in terms of what brands to go to if you really want support or help. On, on who is doing great things, whether it's with packaging or their general ethics. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. It's been a, a really fantastic discussion. Um, loads of great comments. Um, thank you so much for supporting uh, this entrepreneur's community.